gentlemen. Uh, good morning and welcome to our forum and discussion on public policy. Uh, the title of the presentation today is The Snapshot of Innovation Entrepreneurship and Micro, Small, Medium Size Enterprise Development. We have with us here two presenters, uh, Mr. Daniel Topol-Flor from American Chamber of Commerce and Mr. Patrick Hancan from Indonesian Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the weather is not nice, unfortunately, today, but they say we always, look, we always have to look at the bright side of things. So uh, this will allow us to have interactive and more discussion on the topic, first of all, and last but not least, we have more snack and coffee to share. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, Mr. Daniel Belfort, you will be given 45 minutes to present your work and uh, before we come to question and answer. program, which uh, places um, advisors and Kathleen and Apindo to do joint research together to kind of lobby for a better business environment in Indonesia. It's just a big basic overview of what we do. For this paper, um, I do want to issue a disclaimer of sorts and kind of uh, be aware that the, the research that we did for this paper is a basic snapshot. Um, when we're looking at other papers, other research reports, and all the excitement going on within entrepreneurship here in Indonesia right now, um, we didn't see a very comprehensive report pulling everything together so well. Um, so it is a snapshot, and I know you're all probably very informed on entrepreneurship in Indonesia, so what we're going to try to do is run through our presentation because it's information and data heavy. Um, we will cover some points, and it's a little segmented and broken up into three distinct parts. Um, so it doesn't really show the overview of the presentation, but I think through discussion and question and answer, um, we could talk about our findings and our interactions. Um, for our research, we did we talk with a number of the entrepreneurship promotion groups, such as Macar and Gepi. Um, we met with the IT technopreneurs. Um, we got some small forums together, we talked to some microfinance institutions. Um, so based out of Jakarta, our time frame and our resources, I think we did a comprehensive overview, which was you know, in two and a half months. So it's not an in-depth study such as you know, a PhD would do or um, a university in itself. But, but for a snapshot, I think we hit our goals. I think we did find some interesting information, although none of it's Shocking. Um, so, without further ado, I think we'll we'll just get a start. Um, yeah. And so, small and medium-sized enterprises play an important role in the Indonesian economy. Um, they account for over ninety-nine percent of total firms in Indonesia and ninety-five percent of the working population. Um, at that, they only account for about fifty-four percent of total GDP, if I remember correctly. So that's a little bit surprising. Um, considering that they're 99% of all firms. Um, in the beginning, when we started our research, um, just off the top of our head, what we were thinking that is hindering entrepreneurs here was um, access to finance, the ease to register a business to be a formal entity, um, and the lack of usage of uh, professional business services such as you know, insurance, accounting, the things that I thought were normal business when I was in America. Um, we'll get into those ideas a little bit more. As in the interviews that we met with and all the stakeholders we met with actually uh, stated that the Indonesian mindset was a part of it and the risk averse nature, um, as well as the availability of talented workers. Um, those were the two issues that really stuck out as significant problems for entrepreneurship. Um, for a basic characterization of what we saw in the data, um, okay, so they account for 57% of the Indonesian GDP. A majority of uh, micro, small, medium-sized enterprises are self-employed enterprises um, <clears throat> through the family or through the local community. Very few of the people are formally hired or on a contract. <clears throat> um, most of us in these are characterized as low productivity. Um, they they very rarely employ technology. 
methodology of any sort. Um, the, the quality of the products is relatively low, um, and they're even hesitant to export from their local area to different islands in Indonesia or different Kevin patterns as well. So there are a lot of just local economy strictly. And a lot of it's what has been entrepreneurship based on necessity, not so much as actually loving what you do and, and going forward with, with your business. It's been, oh, I can't find a formal job right now, so I must be an entrepreneur. Um, within that 57% of Indonesian GDP and the, the accounting for the numbers, that does include um, various levels of agriculture or food and processing, so it's kind of a lump sum of self-employed people and entrepreneurs. Uh, although the government of Indonesia does support entrepreneurship with numerous initiatives throughout so 13 ministries and um, you know many private uh, companies doing entrepreneurship, um, improvements must be made and we do see that there is significant opportunity for coordination and bringing programs together. Uh, this is a basic definition of what micro, small, medium sized enterprises are characterized by. I won't stay and talk about this very much because it's strict data. Um, these are the numbers from BPS. Let me kind of break it down here. Um, here's our 99 percent of micro, small, medium sized enterprises. Most of them micro, no growing majority. Um, this is how it's broken down with. Um, Agriculture being the uh, agriculture and livestock being the largest industry, followed by uh, services such as trading hotels and restaurants. Um, and here we are. That's some just general data. Um, Sixty-nine percent of the heads are owners, eleven percent supervisors, so on. The majority of the owners are male. The average age was 42. Um, a majority, over 50%, had graduated from C, uh, senior high school. Um, employment, and these numbers are from the age of a very comprehensive survey of um, SMEs around Indonesia. And so we were able to use some of their data to get some of our general information, just for a general characterization. And here's uh, broken down by GDP and how how micro, small, medium sized enterprises fit in there. Um, being that agriculture was the largest, they still do account for a large portion of the GDP. And when we break it down in percentages, their value for their product is lower, which agriculture is usually considered lower value products, I guess. Um, GDP growth, and then this is from uh, personal surveys that the SABAR team did, the challenges here on the bottom. Um, and as you can see, human resources was the <coughs> issue most brought up from everyone we surveyed, um, the lack of, of talent. Uh, the other significant issues was um, lack of payment by other people they sold to. Um, and as an entrepreneur, Significant issue if you sell to someone and they don't pay, and you already have low margins and are struggling to make profit, it's going to be a problem. And then uh, availability of credit was you know, an obvious problem as well. Um, there's been significant improvements in that, but it still hinders many entrepreneurs from um, developing and um, We're going to go into some of the financing issues here. Um, and as we all know, there's been growing microfinance and commercial banks have been trying to start microfinance uh, institutions. Um, but commercial finance is still a challenge for many of the entrepreneurs we talk to, and we'll start to get into those a little bit. Um, kind of what we just talked about. Loans from the commercial bank are ranging from 12 to 14 percent, which is still relatively expensive. Um, other requirements, such as two years business operating, um, a significant cash flows document, and collateral requirements, um, limit the ability for startups, not to say entrepreneurs, but for startups. Um, but nevertheless, the number of non performing loans has increased from 16% to about 19%. Um, so the bank 
students aren't wrong for being diligent and in their in their requirements because there, there is a significant amount of default. Some trends in financing within the banking sector. Um, as you can see, the lending is growing, although year on year not or quarter on quarter not significantly, but overall um, we're doing more. Only around 440,000 out of the 54, approximately 54 million have received credit from banks. Um, a lot of their money comes from family or microfinance and possibly cooperatives. Um, data and numbers. <laughs> so, commercial bank programs for entrepreneurs and small and medium sized financing. Um, <clears throat> bank credit facilities are divided into several groups. Um, micro industries are only able to apply for a loan up to a billion rupiah. Um, small and medium sized enterprises go from 1 billion to 10 billion depending on the industry. Um, medium and large companies can apply for whatever they want depending on their kind of industry and, and what they need and relationships and so forth. Um, debtors must comply with characterized of the of five C's and so to get a loan these companies must meet this, the character and the background of the debtor, capacity to fulfill the responsibilities, the amount of capital they are looking for, and how much collateral they can push through. Um, and in Indonesia, the banks have focused on collateral, which they usually require about 120% um, to 100% of collateral to cover the loan. Um, that most of the time, that's physical collateral, so they need to have either machinery or land or um, and that, another issue that's come up with the type of registration, if they have registered, a lot of entrepreneurs will use personal assets for their collateral, so that's a problem when default has happened is uh, they've lost their own house and cars. Um, if it was a limited liability corporation, they would be able to keep the personal assets separate. Um, one of the programs that Indonesia has come up with was the KUR. Um, it's one of the most best known programs in Indonesia. People pay small business loans. One of the leading banks that manages the KUR is BRI. In two, two ways. They have the application of uh, loans for five million with no collateral. That uh, they can apply for. Um, they only need their ID, so it's relatively simple. Um, but regular BRI branches, they they haven't employed this uh, program quite as well. The issue that did seem to come up with the KUR program is that it's um, poorly socialized and hasn't been advertised as such. Um, and it could be more dispersed more widely, I guess. Um, so now we're going into, aside from the banks, that's, uh, there's a number of different stakeholders that we all know about, angel investors, incubators that will kind of team up with angel investors to improve businesses, um, venture capital, uh, microfinance will fit in here, uh, cooperatives will also fit in here. Um, and then that will go into this Kornikov uh, had a, a business model, and we, we have another slide at the end if someone of us had seen it, but it's, it was more of a Western model of how entrepreneurs will flow into receiving financing. Um, in Indonesia, it's a little bit <clears throat> different. Um, these were the phases of what an entrepreneurship business will go to. So the, the, the phase is the largest period of ideas, start up, scale up, scale up again, and mature. These are kind of the smaller areas of, of where a business is, is growing. In the idea phase, um, it's very difficult for an entrepreneur to get cash to do their business. They usually have their idea, they're working hard, using their own money, using their own work, asking uh, family or friends for who might need to get going. Um, 
startup, they were able to put their idea together, they had their business idea formulated, and they're starting to move forward. Um, there's no formal financing to get yet at that stage. Um, so startups in Indonesia just is quite <coughs> difficult. Um, venture capital can look into, the, into startups, but the amount of venture capitalists in Indonesia is still relatively small. The amount of uh, small, small, medium-sized enterprises here. Um, scale up phase is when there's significant capital needed. Um, the way I looked at it was from an entrepreneur or small businesses uh, when a company needs to buy a truck to actually transport goods. Um, it's very hard for a company to find enough money to be able to buy that truck to expand their business. Um, it was microfinance loans kind of start to peter out and you can't really get more than $5,000 at a period of time. So, um, you know, it's hard to run a growing business with when you can only get $5,000 in financing. So that was kind of the threshold where we saw. And so it was from there at the micro size of about $5,000 to the area of wanting to get up to a commercial loan, which can get up to $10,000 or $20,000. So that actually lets you expand your business. Um, there's a significant gap in that area. And so that's where we found the problems with financing. Um, and then the expansion and maturity that, for our research, that didn't really apply to the micro, small, medium-sized, or micro and small enterprises as 99% of them could not get any extra cash or we're not, we're not getting into that, that stage yet. We're more the startup stage and maintaining small businesses. Um, there are numerous like I mentioned earlier, numerous government policies to promote entrepreneurship in Indonesia, as well as a whole ministry for small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, but all these programs are still dispersed throughout various ministries, 13 of them. Um, there's little coordination to get them going forward. And another issue that, that we found talking with um, a couple of ministries was that they were oftentimes mandated by the central government to implement the program, um, and they, they didn't come up with it on their own. So there was little desire to actually follow up and make sure that the program um, was achieving its goals. So, <coughs> room for improvement. Um, and then we'll talk about how to register a business and some of the issues in there. Okay, as, as we already mentioned in the beginning, we <coughs> business registration is one of the main problems that hinder the SME to grow up, to, to be formal, so they can ask for loan and financing. And from our survey, our survey it showed that 36, 37 percent of SMEs do not have any permit at all. It means that they don't have any business registration or such. But only 47.8, 48 percent is already registered at company. Formerly, the domestic company have access to a wider range of services and institutions, as we have already mentioned, which is including commercial bank, business partners, and of course, when they have a problem at the courts, they will be admitted as a as a law, as a part of the law. They have the rights to protect their rights. And this benefit, actually, for some people, for for some companies, is not significantly clear or not very good enough for producing entrepreneurs to invest in. So that's the reason why most of these people feel that after to register their business. So let me say, this is the benefit of registering business. Business assessment has three primary functions. This is from the government to provide protection to customers, their, work, their workers, their owner, and investor. Two, to control the functioning of certain markets and industries, so they can so they know what happened in this industry, how many companies in it, of production, and etc. And the last is to collect information. But according to our interview with government officials, some other benefits that can be achieved by registering a commerce and company are the law is also more trusted by the, their customer because this company is legal, they have a business registration form, so the customer will believe the more. And of course, access to finance, better access to finance. But the problem is in Indonesia, the procedure to obtain this license is not clear enough. It's, often, it's confusing and overlapping, especially because it's almost each every area, every province has their own law. 
I would, I would be, I would, to register in this law, in this province, it will be different from this other area. And what is what's, uh, one of the main problems also because there is so many pre-registration paper that needed. For example, like the, other than their ID and their family card to they also have to like some kind of explanation for their neighbor if they want to build a business around there. And also, like, uh, it's hard to explain in Indonesia. <laughs> In, in English, so that's right, you got in Mita. So some so for those people it's very hard or it's very troublesome collect all this pre registration paper. And some of entrepreneurs is feel afraid because if they register their business, they also became a subject of two government law. That's this they must pay taxes and of course they also must follow the manpower law for their employee. This is also one of the main reasons why those come to this SME feel reluctant to register their business. Uh, this business registration process is taken for the Jakarta province. The Jakarta area is also according to the law. It's usually it only takes 45 working days, which is, as we all know, in practice and in some areas, it will be very different. <laughs> and this is the five basic type of license that must work by the companies, you can already see it, you, you already know it too, business permit, business location permit, trading license, industrial registration certificates. Okay. And this is according to the government, to this law, there is eight procedure that must be taken from, for a company to register their business. It's from the obtain company gate from the notary, and then they make it public to know whether the name the, the name of the company is already registered or not. And then you can see the procedure itself. And it usually ended with when they must make the MPWP, the tax registration number for their company. But this eight procedure is take 45 days. According to the law, it's only take 45 days. And it's very cheap. But because it's still troublesome and very confusing for most people because the information about this, this procedure, <laughs> there is also another idea by the PKPM to make one-stop shop. One-stop shop is like a is like government body where if you come here, you can register your business easily. You just need your to bring your data, to bring the ID card and procedure. Just give it to them and in in time, they, this this body will this organization, this government organization will arrange it and they will solve it. So, in after 10 or 20 days, your company will be formally registered. In Indonesia, it's also called as kantor pelayanan terpadu, kantor pelayanan perizinan terpadu (KPPT). But our topic, but the problem is the same like the procedure. The information about this one-stop shop in Indonesia is very very few. There is almost from the survey that we do, we conduct most of the people doesn't even know that there is these services by the government, and we think this is one of the things that we, the government should improve. And this, I will explain. This is the problems and the effect to the to the SME. First, is, if we you know that by researching or do this business registration. The photo is maybe small, but for this startup company, it was still a problem. Not to mention that, because in MSME, the owner is must erase the problem, erase the registration by himself, while at the same time, he must also do, do the business. So it's like a time, he will lose the time, he will lose the day to do this business registration. The problem of supporting documents, as you can see. Personal family identification, recommendation letter from the community head, proof letters from the neighbors, even and a tax ID number. And the most problem about the business registration that we also can see is the bribes. <laughs> it's has been a common secret that everybody knows that when you do a registration to make it more faster, so the registration will be faster, you must do some bribing. <laughs> and for us this is another additional cost and it's very problematic for this company to follow it or not. And of course, the most problem is 
the lack of information on their searching process. And so a part of, for me, you know, being that I'm from Amcham and stuff, I, I did want to kind of find a way for the research to look into ways in which American companies are kind of involved within the entrepreneurship uh, arena. And so from my background, um, I used to work in finance, and so I was wondering you know, what do the small and medium sized enterprise do here for um, other business services, um, you know, business planning, accounting, um, insurance, marketing, IT, legal services, so on and so forth. Um, and I was surprised to find that uh, all of these are, are rarely used. Um, one of the pieces of data that I came across was that most business owners, even burgeoning on the medium size, the max that they would pay for professional services was, it was like 200,000 Um I don't even think you can get an accountant to come out for you know, less than 20,000, uh, or less than 200,000. So, uh, the, talking with the multiple people within the um, entrepreneurship promotion and business development realms as well, they all stated that, so accountants are used when they have to throw their annual report together. Um, they don't really only use the business service when they get into trouble. Um, and so business services will give you a better understanding of your own business as well as uh, a product such as insurance that will protect you against downside risk. Um, the use of IT if employed for a relatively low price can, can result in significant abilities for upside potential. And so it was just <clears throat> relatively shocking that hardly any of them are used. Um, I mean, even for the, the lawyers, notaries are used because they're necessary for any type of registration or the little stamps that you must sign. Um, they're, they're used, but legal services on, on how to get a, a proper business registration, you know, what you can do if you actually want to take some report. Court system's a little bit challenging and expensive for you as well, and so many of the services that I thought normal and common place that maintains the structure and the foundation of the business um, was missing. So we don't need to get into all the different types of services, but to mention them that, and all of them are incredibly available here in Indonesia as well, <coughs> socializing the serv services would be useful, but I I guess that goes back to the mindset portion as well of how professional business services, even though you're not buying something concrete that you can hold in your hand that will contribute to your business, this is a piece that is essential for long-term success. And the ability to apply for loans and grants and government uh, programs, etc. Because everyone needs to see cash flow statements. So uh, accounting would be a good start. And Patrick will go through our conclusions and recommendations. So based on our research, we have around nine, then nine recommendations that the state government should do. First, of course, we, because financing is also one of the main problems, the first recommendation is improve people-based small business loans. We already mentioned the core socialization, because I, we think core is already good for this small business, but the problem, most of them doesn't even know that there is this program. Or barely even give this this project. So we we think government should continue to social support and do more promotion for this program. Secondly, we think government supports to create a government incubator entrepreneurship institution. We already know that there is a Mokar and there is a GAPI, but I, we think that there is supposed to be another government owned organization that is focusing on this business incubator so they will have the, these people or this entrepreneur from the startup how to how to begin their business, the business plan, how to access for the accounting program and also the information technology and the law and the legal services. Another alternative, our third recommendation is to get another alternative financing for these people which is through another through an angel bank. 
uh, which collects all the investment from these people that want to help the MS of this entrepreneur, but they doesn't know these people I should give or which industry that I should invest. You think there is supposed to be like a collected fund? This, this organization will collect those funds and distribute it accordingly to the, each company that needed. <coughs> Fourth, we think the government is supposed to standardize the business legislation process throughout the Indonesia. We all know because the government start to decentralization their broke their their law. This make this profits as their own business legislation process, their own law. But this is also the problem that make people reluctant to register their business because in this area, it will be cheaper and faster, but in other areas, it will be more expensive. This will make you confused. What happened here? Why is there a difference? That's why we suggest the government to standardize this business registration, at least this, the business registration process, not every law, not, not the other law, another, people, another problem, but the standardized, only standardize the business registration process. And secondly, and, and fifth, after they make this standardized business registration process, we also think that the government should promote it more, so more people will know what the, the process, and also promote the world existence of one stop shop that we already mentioned it. Another... This is... They do have to explain this. Um, the other suggestion we had was uh, you know, business in a box, um, which would basically be netbooks for small, medium-sized enterprises that are trying to take off. Um, what we would do, the idea would be to, to start with a small pilot project um, and to give you know, one copy pot or something and, and hook up a bunch of entrepreneurs with small networks with flash drives and to create a website um, in, in the cloud, cloud services that brings together all the free services together, such as um, Google spreadsheets and documents and presentation software, etc. As well as being able to post all the ministry stuff online, get your standardized sheets online. Um, you could bring this all together through the technology out there where businesses could work remotely and be able to access all the information that they would need from their area be able to excel, whether they go into the IT industry, or they use that for logistics or bringing out ways to do stuff. Um, you, on, on that site, you would be able to have chat on there where you'd be able to locate best practices. Um, and the other the portion that we thought that would be interesting is if we, we found sponsorship um, for the program. You know, you get a couple of banks, Mandarin is sponsored. They love putting up their signs on the top of the building. So if they were a big supporter and sponsor of this, um, you know that they, they send some of these networks out, they show a number of their banking services that are available on the website, they can look, people can apply directly for either loans or other banking services right there. Um, so it, it creates that foundation for easy business services and business services for people that wouldn't necessarily have the money to be able to um, go do the all this on their own. Um, Indonesia's, you know, through the flash drive modems, Indonesia can be very well connected even in remote areas. And so the business in the box idea um, could really spark lots of domestic business, um, local business, if people were motivated to use it and had a firm understanding with you know, the access at the fingertips. Um, so that's that idea.
And the last is to complete an MSME survey to map out the situation in Indonesian MSME to know where is this which province is better at the or where is the most province with the most MSME and what is the sector that that they have in this province. We think this will help very helpful to to have so the government can focus. We must do this problem in this area. Maybe if they are whether it's IT MSME is is abundant, they will give like uh, internet better internet access or something. And that's our last presentation. And that's the last thing. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yeah, I think uh, we both are uh, concise and uh, well, presentation is concise because it takes less than you work right about. So, um, we have more time for interactive discussion, question and answer. Uh, I will allow one question and you two you can uh, answer that I should. Yes, first, uh, Asulpa. Thank you. Uh, before I raise my phone. 
so they can be secure. Um, you know, they're prolonged, you know, when the price of chickens goes up, and they're significantly affected. So I think that the type of entrepreneur, the type of micro, small, medium sized enterprise is what needs to be looked at. Not just at gross numbers, but on the kind of value those companies are creating. Um, you know, going from you know, maybe just a small peasant agriculture to they're doing some food processing. Um, or crop rotation, or buying new land and employing some technology into that land to uh, make it more productive. Um, these are the issues.
possible with an Indonesian policy, it seems like you're, you're pushing for growth in the provinces in Sumatra, out in your Makassar, you know, Eastern Java, um, you know, even other areas outside of Bali. You know, how do you, how do you work on the connectivity as well as the quality of the human enterprises? Um, you know, again, going back to your question, is, you know, they're heavily agriculture focused. Or do you start going into value-added agriculture, or does then P3I work out and come together in a shorter period of time where they can sell goods at a faster distance and stuff as a wrap? Um, these are all the questions I came up with. And I'd like to know your opinion as you work at the Vice President's team. Um, where do you think it's going, and what do you think are some of the issues or solutions? Those are the questions that we all have to be asked. There's no such an ideal answer to those answers. Because we know that Indonesia is such a large country. Governance is quite weak, we all understand that. And however, the government also supports food, the NPM, if you know the program national for the dynamic year, that's kind of like a social assistance, but also link that if uh, certain uh, people in that uh, urban or rural area they have some kind of uh, business initiative, they can have access to PNPM. PNPM can be accessed nationwide. So, uh, of course, uh, PNPM also has its own issues until now, but that still they can have, uh, I mean, the people in the rural and urban areas, they can still have access to finance through the PNPM program. The amount also uh, depends on the kind of activities or projects that they want to do. Uh, and also the government is pushing the commercial banks, the state banks, to channel the good program more actively. And right now we have seen that uh, good has been accessed by quite a number of uh, entrepreneurs in Indonesia. And for 2011, the portion of the core credit is also increasing. So I mean, yeah, they, uh, the people in the rural and urban areas, they have their kind of um, options of financing, but how the mechanism can create the job creation, wealth creation, it's still a process that we all need to do. Yes, okay. Shall we allow um, more questions? Yes, Dr. Thompson. I can't also with USAID approval. Just a curious uh, question for the group. I was curious uh, if you might be able to elaborate on the results of your survey as compared to maybe some other historical surveys that you built into your research. Are there any, any new trends for entrepreneurs in, in Indonesia that, <coughs> thing, uh, that kind of stood, it really stood out in the results of your survey that says this is something we need to focus on when it comes to supporting the fostering entrepreneurship here in Indonesia? So I have a, a relatively long list here of interesting things that, that we, we came out and we weren't just able to bump them into a presentation because it doesn't really fit. Um, but these from multiple interviews, again going back, talking to um, this, uh, entrepreneurship, promotion groups, government institutions, banks, microfinance institutions, as well as um, uh, collectives of entrepreneurs, <coughs> including people, so on and so forth. These are just some anecdotes that came out through um, the research. Um, most sense of these are, are dependent on the, fill, the founder um, that dictates that pretty much everything they run the whole business, you know, even if it was like an, an engineer per se, they'd still be doing all the advertising, the accounting, and all that stuff. Um, so if the founder had a hard time delegating the activities. Um, the majority of business startups do not have a business plan whatsoever. Um, most companies do not formally register until they need paying capital. 
Most companies are traditional businesses um, doing like handicrafts or agriculture products. Um, they don't use that value chain, uh, value chain products or diversify into other activities. Um, everyone stated that aside from access to financing, there are very few benefits from formally registering your company. Um, most companies don't have a bank account. Uh, co uh, companies don't, as I stated earlier, aren't using business services. Um, <coughs> most companies do not do anything aside from basic cash flows until they see a problem. They review their bank account whether it's going up or down. And, um, there was there was a, an issue within the accounting. Um, <coughs> they usually employ the most basic types of marketing. They don't really use a dynamic strategy at all. Insurance is rarely, if ever, purchased by any company. Um, most smaller companies do not know how to accurately complete an annual report, which is required by the government of Indonesia. Basic financial knowledge is lacking significantly. Um, uh, companies aren't using lawyers. Um, and a majority of the companies aren't using any of the government facilities as well. So even though the government through 13 ministries is promoting, promoting entrepreneurship, most companies don't use these facilities. Um,
SME activities with rural brains. Uh, what, what, what we are finding is uh, not just uh, products of brains, but also services. It's very, very interesting in, 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 in urban areas. Uh, I don't know whether you can probably sometime, uh, uh, one in day you, you can come across our university and, and, and sharing your finding. Uh, right now, is we do have uh, almost 120 Bidan, what is Bidan? A, a kind of uh, uh, SMEs which are, you know, every month we are gathering, have some sampling activities, we call it Bedak Ukai, and we are listening to some success story of young entrepreneurs especially. Uh, they are very interesting and, and, and they are uh, loyal to our activities. Now, we would like to have a kind of I, I talked to my colleague, uh, Sadiq, can you uh, say, for example, uh, a boost, at least uh, 30 or 40 percent of the binaan will be successful in the future, otherwise it's capek, uh, there's no fruitful, but we should have a kind of strategic step. Uh, uh, we, we do have some, some, some advice here, and, and, and and, but one of clique in university also be, uh, like to, to push uh, SME belong to the so-called cooperative, which is more difficult because uh, probably the nature should be different as collectivism is in there, but not like uh, uh, SMEs which is individually is more flexible and so on and so on. So uh, based on uh, my sharing, can you uh, kind of uh, something by, advise us what should we do next in the sense that we should uh, <laughs> no. Yeah, no, 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 yeah, 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 you should visit us and then you can, uh, you know, probably more sharpen our activities because <laughs> we, we do have a guidance for accounting for them, also well, even risk based management which is for me is probably is too far. Probably marketing is more important to them. Financing, of course, we have some collaboration with uh, some, uh, local bank. Even Carrefour not interested to you know collaborate. Now uh, to be more precise, because this urban base, the, the probability of success should be more uh, you know higher compared with uh, rural. <laughs> because of well, I'm not from urban studies. Uh, <laughs> And especially also to not just services but also to uh, economic creative. Because some young guys is uh, uh, doing some entertainment, MC, uh, at, 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 but at their park and surrounding areas. Uh, that's uh, pretty interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you know, we would have loved to have more time to be able to do differences in urban and rural. Uh, the fact is, we didn't have enough time or, or, or resources. And so I, I, I'd like to come down and see just what, what you guys are working on. Um, and what you're doing to hone in entrepreneurship, you know, when you got 120 individuals doing work, I think you, you get to see and really apply the science of entrepreneurship and business to these students to see what kind of success rate. So your applied studies is much more interesting than any research report. Um, and I think the, the findings you will see in the midterm um, will be the type of model you want to do to go forward and be able to replicate um, options. Um, what we did, we did an overview and a snapshot. We, we would have loved to give Dig more, but it is so broad um, with so many different industries and different concerns per business, per location, and that uh, and we're only able to scratch the, uh, the skin of entrepreneurship and SMEs in the But I'd love to see what you're doing. Okay. I have a very small question. Um, uh, would you please uh, explain about 
the primary goal of developing S M S M A, whether it is to develop the number to expand the number of every uh, M S M A, or to upgrade the scale, the, and because they, I think they have their own application. Thank you. Um, so, generally speaking, you know, that it depends on the country. Um, the border here in Indonesia, so what, it, what is the goal here in Indonesia? Is it to create more MSMEs or is it to upgrade the body? Or what, what, what are the national objectives? I mean, you all know more than I do um, what, what the goal is. In my opinion, I think upgrading the quality of the MSMEs is, is the most important. Um, but having millions and millions of MSMEs, sure, that's nice, but you know, per capita GDP isn't going to grow very quickly if it's all um, low value added. So that, that's a national priority, that's, that's what nobody does. Yeah. Not, not the government. I mean, it's what, what local people are doing. And then whether they're going to take that extra step um, to be a high quality, small, medium sized enterprise. Um, and then that's what we're hearing. And then it was interesting in these interviews to hear Indonesians state that uh, the Indonesian mindset was one of the biggest hindrances to the evolution of Indonesian entrepreneurship. Um, so I see that people realize this, recognize this, and are working to improve, and you're getting more prominent entrepreneurs out there, so it's becoming more popular. Um, but there's also 240 million people throughout 13,000 in the other island. So it's hard to get that momentum going in the right direction to improve micro, small, medium sized enterprises anyway. So, Gross number or improvement of value added, uh, it's definitely. Thank you. 
information or to improve for those people in uh, small, minute uh, activity, business activity. Um, I come from the uh, Ministry of Human Empowerment and uh, Child Protection, and uh, we are developing a, a policy based on home industry. And uh, this is a very small, very small uh, activities, business activities for, for women mostly. But anyhow, the policy will also include men and women as well. But by using this uh, information that you mentioned, this can reduce also the, the way of thinking. And I think it's already part of our our planning to establish the policy because we look from the zero people who's, who hasn't started the, the home industry but they already think about it but they never, uh, they just started and then continued up to those people who already in, in your point here is mature but in our position is going to become the micro industry. So we are even below, below of this uh, stage. Um, that's why, that's part of my question. Are you also putting all those pe people lower on this uh, category or it's just put all everything all together in this information while you are taking all the uh, data? For our surveys, we took everyone together. Um, our big data is from BPS, though. And so you, you probably know better whether BPS accounts for that or not. I think they're hard to find. It doesn't count. Yeah. But for our surveys, we, everyone we talked to was starting. I just wanted to add a little social update. Uh, as we present in our slide, you know, we define that these entrepreneurs based on the regu uh, regulation number 20, that micro, small, and medium size. Uh, as you see in our presentation, uh, our recommendation is general, is including all of this segment of entrepreneur. We have data, maybe. Uh, as you know, 99% our uh, SME, and 99% is SME, uh, consists of uh, micro, middle, and small entrepreneur. In our data, the most data uh, uh, from the small, from the micro is 50, 54 million, 54 million entrepreneurs. This micro entrepreneurs sets like a tukang jamu kaki lima, and then. One day. This is the most of the entrepreneurs in, in Indonesia. So maybe we can focus to this uh, uh, entrepreneurs from micro because a small, medium, and micro, the, the big size is from the micro enterprise. So, and from the uh, definition of the regulation is uh, based on the they have, they have under the 50 net assets, yeah? So maybe this is, we can focus this because, uh, you know, 50% uh, 50%, uh, 50 uh, GDP from this, 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 this enterprise. Thank you. Yeah. Our recommendation is general for all this, like IT, maybe IT for the medium size, and uh, cool for small 
and be true. Something like that. That's why our recommendation is very in general. Thank you.
is an institution like university or even high school rather than the educational community. Uh, my final question related to your very first point that one of the most significant uh, hindrances to entrepreneurship in Indonesia is the innovation mindset. I wonder if you can elaborate uh, more on this innovation mindset, what they are, and how can actually we, we change this mindset? Because I think changing the mindset will be hard for the generations. generations. Thank you. If I'm not mistaken, the number one and number three question is similar to what the man said, right? Yes. No. Uh, no, I'm not right. It's more probably the third level there is a hidden for people to want to work rather than run. Yes, it's from our, it's actually from our research and from our interview with government that we found that the reason why many people still reluctant to open the SMB is because their mindset. It will be more safe for them if they working at the professional job at the company. And this mindset is also included by their parents. So if these people open the SMB, like you said, yes, some of them, we do it because we don't have a job, because we want to have some money, because we want to, to do some business. But in the end, in the long term, sometimes they think if we are stable or we already have enough money, we will, we will start to think, we will still try to go back to the professional business if they want to become a worker again at another place. So that's from our survey and from and that's also the space for the number three. This is what we mean by that because this mindset, most people in Indonesia admit it, even me, we tell it's more safe to work at professional. We have a constant salary every year, every month, rather than doing our own business and the income is not stable. So that's, I, I think that's the problem with the Indonesia and about how to change it. That's <laughs> different people know how to do that. But is that unique to Indonesia or also that? Uh, yes, it's unique to Indonesia. So, I mean, in America, it's we, people that are considered entrepreneurs is 5% of the population. 5%? Yeah. America. Well, yeah, I mean, Zero. <laughs> but I mean, that, I think when we look at that level, I think there is, I mean, we have 54 million MSMEs in Indonesia. So that's 25% of the population. So, you know what, who's taking that, what does that statistic mean of 0.2% of Indonesians are on the Does that mean like they have businesses or does that, what does that mean? Um, entrepreneur, you know, in America, it's been interesting, you know, we don't do agriculture the way the rest of the world does it, you know, it's been very corporatized. Um, and so the entrepreneurships in America has gone more on the services side, um, high tech side, and more towards um, niche, niche markets on, on where there, there's a bit more value added performance. And so, I think that that's the trend of what entrepreneurship aims for. Um, I, I wish we still had non pop restaurants and stuff, but American corporations and large businesses have kind of cleared out uh, the bottom end of entrepreneurs in America. And so it, it's an interesting dynamic. Um, and you can't say what's good or bad because you know, small businesses create jobs and livelihoods and you're able to live your life. Um, corporates are incredibly competitive and will lay people off and don't care about people so much that it's not like bottom line. So, you know, what, what's a good model? What are, what are the goals in general, I guess? And, and that's something each individual, each country needs to address on their own. Um, you know, Butan does their gross domestic happiness number. I think that's pretty cool. Um, you know, growth rates, uh, you know, I don't think that's the most important thing. Yeah, I And for the government support entrepreneur, maybe I don't make it clear, maybe it's just like the government giving some fun for the... We, we get this idea from a 
like a business like a university at Bandung for the technique for the technique. They said that they received a funding from their for the Ministry of Industry, which they will give it to their to their college student. So if this college student have some business in this sector, in this in the industrial sector or in, in manufacturing, they will give this presentation and they and this university will have this student to make their business from the business plan and from accounting and etc. And we think this is very good, but we think it's not fair, not many university or any national university move to be accurate that still that do this. We are sort of from our friend that University of Indonesia will be good that the uh, private business incubator the university makes better. So we think that maybe the government should promote this program to include in every national university and maybe in the next time in private university because right now private university we think is more often to this because the Chipota University, Prestemula Business School, and we think this is very good to make many entrepreneurs in Indonesia. That's what we mean by this recommendation. And on a similar note, um, Amcham just started supporting uh, Junior Achievement in Indonesia, Prestas and Junior, that gets um, business people to support a school or to send business professionals in to teach entrepreneurship. And they have that dynamic program where they create businesses for a year, and then at the end of the year, they liquidate the business and the product, and they learn how to make a business plan and do accounting. Um, they had a national uh, event here, and then they also had the regional event here to see all these high school students come together, creating these amazing business plans and uh, innovative products, and just seeing how these kids would get so excited about running their business. Um, What's the way you get people excited about entrepreneurship and opening a business and seeing that they can do it and have the confidence? I mean, when, when I was able to meet these high school students and shake their hands and look them in the eyes, they were just full of confidence and excitement and ready to sell their product. And um, you know, they were they were pumped about business. They were very excited about it, and it was, it was great to see. Um, I think I think that's where you really start to promote, promote it and build that culture of, of ambition and being able to do your, your own businesses and stuff. Because even uh, what I've noticed a lot, many of the entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs we say, and, and the successful ones, a lot of them are, are family-based. I mean, that, you know, they, they had quite a bit of capital to start with. You know, can, is that, yes, they're entrepreneurial, but, you know, is that what we're calling an entrepreneur? Um, you know, I could be a great entrepreneur if I had five million dollars in capital as well. Um, so, you know, you have, there's a lot of variety, um, and I think education is, is the way to do it as well. So if you can think di dynamically and critically, then you can achieve whatever you want. So, thank you. My name is Yuri from Semeru. Uh, I'm very interested with the general character, general characterization of Indonesian MSMA. Uh, can it be divided by gender? Because uh, from the financing sector, uh, currently uh, the PTPN Sharia uh, not only focus on the general characteristic of the MSMA uh, for finance plan, but also they try to give a particular characteristic uh, for the woman. Uh, and they, from their presentation, uh, they they uh, they find they found a very low non-performing loan from the, uh, the gender uh, from the, uh, for the woman. Uh, when they give a finance to them, <coughs> it's about one and a half million. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'm very curious. Uh, why don't you uh, have any uh, consideration on that? And uh, how about the recommendation on, uh, on this situation? Is there any relation to the gender relation in? Uh, in Indonesia, or from this, uh, from your study, 
for the micro scale, is there? Uh, can we keep it in younger end? Uh, we didn't cover that at all. Based on time, <laughs> um, I mean, there, we could have covered. I, I would have liked to have covered just one of these topics in the whole study, to be honest, and, and be able to focus and and do more of a directed study. Um, I mean, what you're saying is basically driving game signing as well, right? That he implemented throughout all of Bangladesh, and then you know, that's expanded further. I mean, the fact of the matter is women are just more responsible than men. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, they're, they, they won't go waste money the way I would. Um, so my priorities seem to be different. And I mean, from all the literature and studies I've, I've read, it, it's the same thing. It's just women are more responsible than men and know how to take care of money better. Uh, but, you know, it, it's funny to say directly, but it, I think it's true. Um, and, and you see it in um, entrepreneurship and microloans and all this. Um, and, and all the literature throughout the world. It doesn't matter you know, whether you're in a South Asian Muslim country or if you're in a Central African Christian country or whether you're in a Central American uh, Catholic country or any of them. Women have always been more responsible when it's come to like micro loans and being able to use that money and repay that money and feel that responsibility and that yeah. um, so version. You can say that increase in non-performing loan here is those by men. <laughs> I never go get down there, so no comment. No comment. Okay, more questions. Uh, yeah, actually, um, my friend over there is already asked about this. Uh, when I look at it also, I wonder why it's only 23 females, because in our, our uh, Money, 
Yes, Komara, I, I support you. I, 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 we are also uh, searching or looking at such kind of model. Of course, uh, uh, we do have a lot of type of economic uh, <laughs> but, but uh, the, if your finding can pick up uh, the key point of uh, which is uh, what should I say? Make uh, SMEs in creativity sector, special services uh, uh, can be pushed to the United cities. That's going to be good for us. So I mean, I've been grasping at this creative economy idea also, and I don't really get promoting creative economy. Like, how do you make a model to be creative? I mean, I'm not a very creative person. I'm from, I like weird movies, and from America we have all this stuff, and how, how do you create a model to be creative? And that's something in an individual, um, you know, someone that's good at being creative are a special artists. You can, you can foster people in school to, to ask questions, to explore ideas, to create beautiful drawings and stuff, but, I mean, creating a model, uh... May, may I say this one? Okay. Say, for example, Banu. Yeah. Banu's people is, is to some extent, crazy. Many crazy things there. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, music, indies, uh, factory, fashion. And so, we are looking for why Banu is... Gongli is there. But, some, some of you, I don't know whether knowing or not, the only biceps knowing. But <laughs> Gongli, for example. <laughs> so many crazy things in Bangu. So I, I'm telling the clique in Mala, hey, my clique, it is in some university, can you make Mala as a kind of Bangu Jakarta? Um, so uh, some uh, weekend activities from Surabaya and Surabaya is going to Mala. Yes, but we, we do have uh, some uh, resort city, Batu, but but it's not like Bandung, for example. That's, that's what we're look, looking for. Uh, I, I don't know, we have to explore, of course. Well, I, mean, yeah, I yeah. think, in, in my opinion, as a foreigner outside living and, and working in Indonesia, that there's, you know, with traditional, traditional values with, I, I mean, I think to say traditional values aren't creative, but like, there you know, concerts and you know, people getting together and graffiti and stuff like that. You know, this is like a new wave of untraditional creative stuff. While the traditional side you know, kind of frowns on that and it will directs people in another direction. And so, you know, that's up, up to your culture to decide on, on how to, to promote your own creativity and to you know, within your traditions and moral values, where can you be creative and progressive at the same time? Um, and and where, what geographically, where can you do that as well? Um, you know, Bandung's the suburbs of Jakarta, even though it's a giant city. And so, you know, kind of any, anything can kind of go because it's a big place. Um, so, like, exporting that model to somewhere else um, will be more challenging. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I hope that we, we have already, uh, you, the two of you have already answered both questions. So if I add more, it could be that back.